Good afternoon. My name is Lou Silverman. I am an attorney in Tempe, Arizona. The name of my law firm is Silverman Law Offices. I've been practicing law for about 30 years. For many of those years, I was in litigation. What I learned about being a litigation attorney is that I would like to help people avoid litigation. As an estate planning attorney, my desire is to create plans for my clients that work to provide seamlessness and to help people stay out of the courtroom. What is the definition of estate planning? Well, it's very simple. The definition of estate planning is to give to whom I want, when I want, and at the same time pass along my wisdom. Today I'm going to discuss foundational estate planning. By that, I mean creating an estate plan to include wills, trusts, living wills, and powers of attorney. Beyond the scope of foundational estate planning are such other topics as charitable planning, retirement planning, and other subjects which we're not going to be covering today. There are three foundational estate plans to consider. The first that I'm going to mention is doing nothing at all, which is, by the way, what most people do, nothing. I mention this because when you do nothing, you still have an estate plan. It's the plan provided by the state by default. In the case of disability, meaning you're incapacitated and unable to manage your affairs, the court will appoint people to handle your affairs for you. This is what I call living probate and involves guardians to take care of your personal matters such as health care and conservators to manage your property. In the event of death without an estate plan, which is called intestate, your assets will go to your heirs based upon state law not based upon what you want or don't want. Your estate will go through the other kind of probate, which is what I'll call death probate. That's where the court appoints a personal representative of your estate. Again, not someone you pick, but someone the court picks. And then your estate is administered by that person. Now we'll move to the second type of estate plan, since we all agree that doing nothing is not good. The second plan is a will-based plan, along with powers of attorney for finance and health and a living will. The powers of attorney allow you to appoint the people who you choose to decide your health care decisions if you are unable to make those decisions, and to take care of your property and finances as well. This alone avoids living probate. The last will and testament designates who handles your estate upon death called a personal representative. Again, this is someone you choose, not someone up to the court. And of course, in a will, you designate who gets your property on death. You may also appoint guardians to have custody of your minor children. If you have failed to appoint guardians, there is a long list of relatives who may have priority and may ask the court to appoint them. You will have no input whatsoever into probably the most important decision of your life. That would be who takes care of your children if you are not around. In a recent case that we've had, mom and dad had young children and didn't have a will, and people were coming out of the woodwork trying to be appointed as guardian. Siblings, grandparents, parents, and the court had a very difficult decision making a decision who would be the best guardian. This is an important decision that you should make and not leave it to the court. The biggest disadvantage of a will-based plan is that your estate will still have to go through probate and most of my clients prefer to avoid probate. So how do we avoid probate?
One method is a living trust-based estate plan, where you create a trust and title your assets in the trust name. I will come back to this in a moment. For those who don't want a trust, or a trust is not in their budget, there are tools to create a plan to pass assets and death without probate other than a trust. I will review a few of those tools and discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages of them as well. The first is joint tenancy financial accounts or real estate. This is most common with married couples. Upon the first death, the assets automatically pass to the surviving joint tenant owner. The second is pay on death accounts known as POD. These assets pass to a named beneficiary or beneficiaries. The most common examples are life insurance, annuities, and some bank or investment accounts. The third tool is called a beneficiary deed to real estate. The beneficiary deed specifies one or more persons to take ownership upon the death of the owner or owners. All that is needed on death is to record a death certificate. There are some disadvantages and definite traps with these tools. With joint accounts, I often see a parent creating a joint account with children. By doing so, the parent is exposing his assets to the creditors of his children. The second problem is if a parent creates this account with one of several children, relying on the trusted child to pay his bills and then share with his or her siblings. Too many times, I've seen that the child claimed that mom or dad wanted him to have these funds and not sharing them with the siblings. The same challenge is present with POD accounts, designating one of several children to receive the assets and then relying on him to share. The courts have held that these accounts are virtually bulletproof, meaning that the disinherited children cannot attack the account on the basis that mom or dad didn't intend this result. I recently had a case in which a father left almost a million dollars in certificates of deposit to one of three children by designating the son as the POD beneficiary. Everybody knew that dad intended for this son to pay the dad's bills and then share with his siblings. Well, as you can imagine, the son said, no, dad wanted me to have these funds. After a protracted court battle, the court very begrudgingly said that they couldn't do anything because the accounts, as I said, are bulletproof and the son got to keep this money. It was a sad legacy and a sad result. POD accounts are also a problem if any of your beneficiaries are minors or impaired or incapacitated you are creating a whole other set of problems by leaving assets to these individuals, which is going to require yet another form of probate, which is the living probate or the conservatorship, to have somebody handle these assets of the minors or the incapacitated persons. Finally, beneficiary deeds present a challenge if there are too many children. For example, assume dad has five children and chooses a beneficiary deed to leave his home to them. He is creating a partnership with no agreement, no deadlock breaker, and the kids may not agree on what to do or how to manage the house. One may want to sell, one may want to live in the house, another may want to rent the house. In this event, the beneficiary deed was not a good choice. The final foundational plan that I'll discuss is considered the Cadillac of estate plans, 
it's a living trust-based plan. A living trust-based plan avoids probate on both disability on death. It involves creating a trust agreement, usually called a living or a revocable trust. This works for both single people and married couples. The living trust appoints a trustee to manage assets. Most people who create a trust appoint themselves as trustee, so you'll have full control over your assets as long as you are able to manage them. If you become incapacitated, the trust appoints a successor to manage your assets for you and take care of your assets, all done privately and seamlessly. For a married couple, a trust provides the best mechanism to avoid or minimize paying estate taxes and providing for a surviving spouse, at the same time ensuring that the assets go to your children and not to a new spouse of a husband or wife. And finally, a trust provides a great mechanism to take care of your children by creating trust for them which may allow you to appoint someone to manage your children's assets when they are younger and to allow the child to serve as his or her own trustee when they are older and all the while enjoy creditor and divorce protection. One caveat about trusts is that in order to benefit from the trust your assets need to be titled in the trust name or beneficiary designations to assets such as life insurance need to be coordinated to fund the trust upon a death. I see many clients who come in after there's been a death whose assets have never been titled in the trust and unfortunately I have to give them the bad news that the estate needs to be probated because the assets are still in the name of the deceased. So to, in order to avoid probate and get the full value out of a trust-based plan, it is really important to get the assets titled properly. A trust will do you no good if your assets and your beneficiary designations are not properly titled. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and I invite you to contact my office to schedule an appointment at no charge to discuss which forms of foundational estate planning might work for you and your family. Thank you again.